Hello, 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 hello. Hello, hello, awesome. Okay, so I'll just put it here. Okay, great. Excellent. <laughs> Finally got it. It's working, finally. Um, okay, I'm just hoping you guys can hear me just from here rather than using a microphone. Um, hi everyone, I'm Omna. <laughs> I'm in sixth year at the moment. So I'm gonna teach you neurohistory and exam for OSCEs. So I've tried to tailor it to exactly what you need for OSCE level. Um, so I've gone through the handbook and just made sure that I'm not teaching anything extra because who needs that right now? I think you just need, especially for neuro, just to get the kind of really important pearls. Um, but first off, I just want to give you a couple of tips and tricks just generally for OSCEs. The first one is to breathe and then to smile. It's really important. It helps with rapport a lot. And then reset between each station because I often found that you'd have a station that kind of riled you or just you didn't do as well as you wanted um, and that will affect your later ones if you don't just take a second to go, oh well, move on, I'm okay. Um, and then be observant, describe what you see. Your patients should not have signs, they should be perfectly healthy, but if they do have signs, it does look really bad if you don't say something about them. Even if you don't describe them in like the perfect medical terminology, just describe what you see. So you can say, oh, their eyelid is drooping, that's fine. You don't have to know the full medical terms, but just do say it in case if it is there. Um, acknowledge their feelings and concerns. That's super important. That's literally in the guidelines for you guys for your marking. If a patient says, I'm really worried about this, don't just go, okay, tell me more about it and then move on to something else. Tell, say something to them. So do say something like, I understand that must be really hard for you. Um, so just that little acknowledging sentence is enough to say to the examiner, okay, this person understands that they should have that rapport with their patient. And then finally, summarize back in the history. That's again, part of your marking criteria. So, and it just shows that you're listening um, and it will help you too, because it helps you gather your thoughts a little bit to put it all together and say it back to the patient and ask them if you've missed anything and they will tell you if on their sheet you've missed something that they were meant to say. So that's really useful. Does that all sound okay? There's all just like some overview things. Um, okay, so I wanted to talk, I'm gonna try and go through both history and exams. It's a lot, so I will be going fast. And these slides I'm gonna give to Michael, so I don't have to take them all down. Um, and these are, I'm hoping these can be used as your notes. I've tried to make, like actually put as much info on there as you would need. Um, so don't worry about taking this all down right now. So firstly, wash your hands, do it as soon as you walk in, don't forget. Secondly, introduce yourself, ask the patient's name and their age, write them both down or you will forget them because you're going to have a few patients in a row. And then just explain what you're going to do. So that's the marking criteria there. So you just need to get a pass. You can all get P pluses in this area for sure. Um, and then that's my little spiel that I used to say. So I used to kind of write it out as if I was like acting. So I'd have a little script for myself. And that's what I used to say just as an example. Next, begin with those big open questions. A good one to start is, so what's brought you in today or what's your biggest concern that's brought you in today? Um, and the three that they want you to know for phase one are headaches, weakness, and alterations in sensation. So those are the three that I focused on here. So again, those are the two criteria you'll be doing in your OSCE. And that's one, listen attentively, engage the patient, build that rapport. And the second one is to get the clinical history, which we're about to do. And regardless of um, what they come in with, the big thing they want you to focus on is how it's affected their activities of daily living. So more than just, I guess, the basic pathophys of what's going on with them, it's about the, how that's affected them in their daily life. So headache, I'm not gonna go through all this, it's a lot of text on a page, but it's Socrates, essentially, on the side. Um, and then within each text box, I've got like the question you could ask within Socrates. Most importantly are the associated symptoms, so A, so the other deficits associated with the headache, 
Um, and secondly is the other questions about headaches. So asking about if there's an aura, because that will make you think of migraine. Asking about if there are other constitutional <laughs> symptoms like nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, fevers, um, night sweats. Those will all make you think of maybe a malignancy that's going on. And then finally, in severity, that's when you can ask questions about their activities of daily living. So does it stop you from performing your regular activities? Weakness, again, I've just split it into Socrates, and the same with sensory disturbance. Um, and the most important things are similar to the headache. So it's neurological deficits, and it's further weakness-related questions, like did it come on suddenly? Have you ever seen any trouble going to the bathroom? That's an important one because they can lose sphincter control if it's a um, spinal cord uh, lesion. And then associated spinal pain as well. And then below, I've just written a few questions you can ask for ADLs. So can you walk 500 meters on your own? Um, or do you use something to assist yourself? Do you, are you able to go to a shower by yourself or do you use aids? Can you dress yourself? Those kinds of things. Cool. Past medical history. So importantly here is risk factors. So things like diabetes, high cholesterol or high blood pressure are all risk factors for stroke. Um, and so those are important things to talk about. And then in family history, it's just, has this ever happened to anyone in your family? Have anyone in your family ever had a stroke? Um, any heart disease? And then those same chronic conditions again. Sorry, I'm speeding through it, but it'll all be on the slides so you can look at them later. Um, social history, uh, just risk factors again are the important part of this. And then the daily living. So do they have support? Do they have a carer at home who takes care of them? Um, those kinds of things. So in terms of risk factors, it's the exercise and it's diet. Uh, and then obviously within there as well is the smoking and alcohol um, and other drugs. All right, we're going to move on to exam. Is everyone okay with that so far? Any questions so far? Okay, cool. Let's go on. So cranial nerves. So first things first, again, you just signpost what you're about to do. So tell them again. Um, the examination you're going to give, wash your hands again just to show them that you've done it, um, and then position the patient. So. What I've got is, thank you so much for talking to me today. I'm going to do an examination of the nerves that supply your face now. So that will involve me testing your senses, having a look and a feel of your face, and testing your reflexes. Is that all right with you? And an important one to add on, just to sprinkle on some rapport, is if it hurts at any time, please let me know. That's a really good way to just tell the examiner I'm watching out for the patient. Um, and then for positioning, you want to have the patient sitting across from you about an arm's length away on a chair at the same eye level. So you're going to start off with generally inspecting the patient. So the most important things, the things they mention in the clinical guide, are to look at the face for asymmetry or muscle wasting, and to look at the eyes for ptosis, proptosis, and then the pupils. So that's what you're going to say on inspection. Often you can't say this stuff out loud. Your examiner will sometimes say to you, I don't want you reporting back as you go. But make a real effort of like, showing them that you're looking at those things. So you can even say it to the patient. You can say to the patient, I'm having a look at your pupils now to see if they're symmetrical. That's okay to say out loud, because then the exam, you're not talking to the examiner, you're talking to the patient, but you're kind of using them as a conduit of info to the examiner. Um, so that's what I used to do if they didn't let you report. But they will all hopefully be negative. So you will just be saying to the, to the patient slash examiner, oh, there's no asymmetry of your face and it doesn't seem like you've got any muscle wasting. I don't see any um, drooping of your eyelids, that kind of stuff. <coughs> cool, going on to the cranial nerves. So um, first one, forget about it. You guys don't have to do it. Um, it is easy to do. You just have to ask them if they've had any change in their smell. Uh, and then you do get them to smell some things. So that's later on in phase two and three. You might be excited to do this. So little things like an alcohol swab is perfect to use in that situation. Close their eyes, let them smell it, and tell you what they smell. So they should say it smells like alcohol. Um, next is visual acuity. So cranial nerve two, the optic nerve. This is the Snellen chart. Often you won't have to do this again in OSCEs because it takes a bit too long and they want to assess that you know the rest of it. So they're not going to ask you often to use a Snellen chart, but do know how to just in case you're that unlucky person who has to do it. So again, often it will be a handheld Snellen chart. If you're doing it in OSCEs, it won't be set up in the room. So with that, make sure they are using their glasses, give them the Snellen chart, let them hold it one arm's length away, cover one eye at a time, read the lowest line they can from left to right. Um, and then test the other eye and get them to do it backwards this time so that they don't just regurgitate the same line they said before and have memorized it. Uh, and then know 
what's good and what's bad. So 6.5 is very good, 6.12 not so good. The reason is the 6 is they're seeing it from 6 metres right now, but they're seeing at 6 metres what a good person can see at 12 metres, right? If they're seeing at 6 metres what a person can see at 5 metres, a normal person, then they've got even better vision than a normal person. Does that all make sense? Excellent, guys, you're great. Um, the next is the visual fields. So this one's a little bit hard to do. I always find like the movement of my hands and their hands quite difficult. The most important thing is you're mirroring them or, or they're mirroring you. So the instructions I say is um, just sit down with me. Um, and then what we'll do is I want you to keep your eyes looking at my, like straight at me and don't move your eyes at all. Um, and then when you see my fingers wiggling, I want you to tell me that you can see them, okay? And so I get them to cover, let's say cover your right eye for me, so they'll cover that eye, and then I'll just mirror them, okay? And then what you want to do is if you can see your eye, if you can see your fingers wiggling, they should be able to see them too. So if you can't see them, then they shouldn't be able to see them either. So if I get a volunteer, actually, does someone want to come up quickly? Michael, come on up. Can you describe that seat for me? So I'll just pretend that I'm like sitting opposite Michael. Come closer, <laughs> sorry. Yeah, perfect, okay. So I'm sitting opposite Michael. I'll just get you to cover that eye for me. Okay, perfect. So tell me when you can see my fingers. I want my hand equidistant between the two of us, okay? And so I'll just tell him, let me know when you can see them. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, perfect. So he could see them about when I could see them and that's the idea. Does that kind of make sense? So then you'll cover the other hand. It's the other hand, yeah, perfect, and you'll do the same thing. Okay, some people switch to go like this when they are doing this side, and that's fine too, as long as you're covering the same eye as the person. Do you want to stay there for me? Because I might do some more with you. <laughs> awesome. Um, okay, next we're testing two and three together, and those are eye movements. So I'm just going to do the same thing. I'm sitting at eye level with Michael. My hand is equidistant between the two of us, and I'm going to get him to follow the tip of my finger with his hands, but keep his head perfectly still. Some, some patients are told to move their head. So they're told to, even if you tell them, they'll start doing this and you've got to correct them. Don't just let them do it because that's actually part of the exam. So if Michael starts doing this stuff, I'll just say, oh, sorry, Michael, can you just keep your head still, but just move your eyes. So with it, I'm just going to get him to move his eyes to the, no, <laughs> keep your head straight. Um, move, his head, move his eyes all the way to the periphery. And what am I looking for at the peripheries in particular? Exactly, and that will be most, like, most prominent on the periphery, so that's when you're looking for it. And that's just the eyes shaking back and forth, and that tells me that the muscles aren't working as well as they should be, because it should be well controlled, even on the peripheries. So I'm going to get Michael to follow. Perfect. All the way across. Okay, great. Perfect. Thank you so much. Okay, so a good way to remember... Oh, what have I done? This isn't even the right slide. Apologies. A good way to remember eye movement in terms of the nerves that supply which like areas that it's moving to. So what I like to think of is the abducens, right? It abducts your eyes. So that's an easy one to remember. So the abducens nerve will take your eyes away. So left eye that way, right eye that way. Okay. And then the cranial nerve four, which is the trochlea. Um, so it's bringing your eyes together and crossing them. So kind of going four-eyed, that's how I like to remember it. So a cranial nerve four makes you go four-eyed. Or it's very hard if to force yourself to go cross-eyed. So those are my two ways to try to remember force or four-eyed. And then cranial nerve three does everything else. So cranial nerve three is like every other movement you can think of. Does that help? I hope that helps. Um, that's how I thought of it. And then we're just going to go to pupils for a second now. So make sure you have your light on you. You want to ask the patient to put their hand right on their nose so that that my light from this eye isn't shining into the other eye indirectly, okay? So then I'm going to test by just swinging the light in and then back out. Why am I going to do it twice? So I'm going to go, I'm going to go into his right eye twice. So why am I doing that? Uh, exactly, the consensual reflex. And the reason you do that in the exam rather than just shining it in once and then looking at both is so the examiner knows you're doing it. Right? So you want to go in, looking at that pupil, and then again, looking at this pupil to see a consensual reflex. All your patients will have a consensual reflex because they're all going to be normal. And then you do it to the other side. Okay? Brilliant. And then accommodation, I'll just say, hey, Michael, can you look um, just at this light here for me? And when you see my finger, just constrict and focus on my finger. Okay? And I want to bring it up, again, the same kind of area, about halfway between the two of us and just see if he constricts. Perfect. So you just want to see equal constriction of both eyes to look at my finger. Brilliant. 
stop me at any time, friends. Just let me know if I'm going too fast or anything. Yeah, any questions? Trigeminal. OK, so this is when you need to get a little cotton bud, and you're going to test their um, sensation. And so trigeminal has three branches, ophthalmic, maxillary, mandibular. So a good place to do is forehead, cheek, and then jaw. And what you want to do is test side to side. So not one, two, three, but test both sides of the temple first, and then both sides of the um, cheek, and then the jaw. And the reason is you're asking them to compare between the two, OK? Because that's where you'll see the difference. So I'll first show Michael what it'll feel like by touching the cotton wool to his sternum and saying, this is how it's going to feel. Then I get him to close his eyes. And then I say to him, tell me when you feel it. So you don't go, can you feel this? Can you feel this? Because they'll just say, yeah, even if they can't. You've given them that prompt. So you say, tell me when you feel it. And so I'll go, tell me when you feel it. So close your eyes. Da -da -da, da -da -da. Did it feel the same on both sides? And they'll say, yes, no. OK? And then the muscles of mastication, which are also supplied by trigeminal. I'll ask Michael to please clench his jaw for me. So grit your teeth, clench, and then I'll just feel <coughs> the, three, the two there. Yeah? Perfect. All right. Seven. This is the fun one. So this is when you say to them, we're going to do some funny facial expressions together. This is my favorite part. Um, so you get them to raise their eyebrows as if they're really surprised. Perfect. And you want to see some furrows unless they've had some really great Botox up there. Then you want them to get them to scrunch their eyes. And when they do that, don't let, them, don't let me open it. So you want to try and open their eyes. Then puff up your cheeks and don't let me deflate them. That's a fun one. And then smile for me, show me all your teeth. And then frown and furrow your brow. Yeah, perfect. So those are the things you can do. If you miss a couple of those, it's OK. But do try to get as many of them as possible. It's fun to practice with friends this bit. It's really fun. Um, OK, and final cranial nerve that you need to know is vestibular cochlea, cochlea. So this is about hearing. Start off with the crude test, which is perfect. Exactly, some people are doing it already. So with this one, you're going to say, I'm going to rustle my fingers next to your ears. Tell me which side you hear it on. Their eyes can be open for this because really they're not going to see your fingers. Do test left, right, and both. If you want to be a bit tricky, you can do like left, left, both, right. You know, you can be a bit tricky there. Um, now, regardless, you will go on to Renee's and Weber's because you're in an exam. But normally, you could say to them, "This is there was no abnormality detected, so I would move on from this examination because they have no hearing abnormalities on like crude <coughs> testing." Um, so. Renee's the Webbers. The way I remember is Webbers. Weber kind of sounds like center, whilst Renee's doesn't. So <laughs> Weber is the one where you bang the tuning fork and then you place it on the center of their head, whilst Renee's is the one where you test bone conduction versus air conduction. So in Webbers, you want to, um, a big thing is don't hit the tuning fork on the patient. That has happened before. Someone's gone, oh, I'll just <laughs> bang it on their head. Um, bang it on something else and then put on top of their head. And you want to ask them, do you hear it in the center or do you hear it on one side more than another? And they will normally just say, I hear it in the center. If they have sensory neural hearing loss, then the affected ear won't hear it as well. But the actual opposite occurs in conductive hearing loss. So the affected ear, the ear that's deficient, will actually perceive the sound as louder. OK, so that's why we then do web, sorry, Rene's to actually ascertain whether it's sensory neural or conductive. Does that make sense? Sorry, Michael, you're just going to staying up here for a second. Actually, you, you can go back. I think it's done for now, but I'll call you back in a minute. Um, yeah, so Rene's is when we bang the tuning fork and then we bring it and put it on the bony prominence behind the ear. And then when they tell us that they can no longer hear it, we take it out and let them hear it in the air. And if they can still hear it, then that's Rene normal, which is Rene positive. OK, everyone can do that normally. Um, in uh, sensory and neural hearing loss, it's going to be Rene's positive. So it's going to be normal. The same thing where they'll hear it on the bone, they'll feel the vibration or hear it. And then when they can no longer hear it and you bring it to their, just the ear through air conduction, they'll still be able to, they'll hear it again. So that's sensory and neural hearing loss. So you can put the two together. So if in Weber's test, they couldn't hear the tuning fork on that side, and then when you test it with Renee's, they have normal Renee's positive, that's sensory and neural loss on that side. Now, I'm, this is more than you need to know. You don't need to actually be able to diagnose, and your patients will not have anything wrong with them. But this is just a little bit of fun, I guess. Um, and then in conductive hearing loss, bone conduction, 
um, so it will be better than air conduction. So air conduction will be worse. So when they stop hearing it, if you ask them to listen for it next to their ear, they won't be able to hear anything. Cool. Guys, you smashed it. We've gone through cranial nerves. That was like a whiz bang straight through it all. But the summary is, so visual acuity Snellen, then visual field accommodation, pupils, eye movement, feel the face and the muscles, move the face, test the hearing. Okay. Do we want to give a really quick go with the person next to us, near us? Just try and literally breeze through these as fast as possible. You can actually do them, I reckon, in about four or five minutes if you go fast. Forget Snellen, obviously. Yeah? You want to try it? Obviously, pupils, maybe, if you don't have time for that, do that. But I'm going to give you, yeah, four minutes. We're going to try and do as many as possible in four minutes. <laughs> yeah? <laughs> Don't do it to me. I'll be your patient. I'll bring. I'll bring my chair over. Oh my guys, sorry to cut you 
lost in the middle, but that was good practice, everybody. Um, a couple of things. So um, one thing that's good is if you forget to test the muscles of mastication, you can do it when you get to when you get to facial, then you get to smile. It's a good time for you to test it because they're already smiling. So things can go out of order, and that's fine um, because as long as you do get through most of the cranial nerve, you've done a good job. And the examiners know that you're in a stressful situation, and there's a lot to remember in cranial nerve exam. Um, I know that when I did it in my GP this year, like I just kept having to do them because she kept saying, "Oh, let's just do a new exam for this patient. She's got a migraine." And so you get to the point if you practice maybe five, six times, that it becomes super quick. Um, so just do it a few times with your friends, like say for the whole day, or maybe like just a half day, just keep doing them again and again, and by the end, I promise, you'll be so good at cranial nerves. Okay, we're gonna go to peripheral neuro. So I have some fun dances for this to remember the different um, nerves and which areas they supply, so hopefully that helps you guys. But firstly, it's just the signposting, introduction, explain what you're gonna do, all that jazz. Um, in the upper limb, you want the patient to be sitting upright and their arms are fully exposed, in the lower limb, get them to lie down, their legs fully exposed, underwear on, and maintain that respect and privacy for the patient with a patient gown or a blanket, so that as much as possible, you're not uncovering them the whole way through the examination. Mission, I can't speak. Um, so this is a great way to remember the order, TM, Neela, Litsuhi, I loved it. Um, is the Pope really super Catholic? So I for is inspection, uh, the T, tone, power, reflexes, sensation, coordination. So is the Pope really super Catholic? Now you don't have to remember coordination at the moment, but in phase two you'll need it. So just keep that acronym or that way to remember it in mind. All right, so beginning, general inspection. So their surroundings, they have a wheelchair, they have a walking aid at Vinnie's, they will most likely have something. So, oh, thank you so much. At Vinnie's, they will most likely have something hiding somewhere. That's like that's what they're known for. So if you're placed at Vinnie's for your OSCE, look everywhere. And if you spot it, then they will give you props for that. Um, and then any obvious things that are going on. Have they got an obvious droop? Have they got fasciculation, so little tremors in their muscles? Or any abnormal movements like a chorea? Um, so yeah, just this is what I would normally say, which is, there doesn't appear to be any mobility aids around the patient. Um, they appear alert and conscious, breathing room air, looking more closely, seem to have normal posture and movements, no signs of muscle wasting, fasciculations or tremors. If you say that out loud, it sounds pretty cool. If you can't say it at the beginning, say it at the end when you summarize, it also sounds pretty cool then. Okay, then you wanna tell them what you're gonna do. The first thing is tone. So a tone, I'm gonna hold your arm or leg now. Could you just go all floppy for me like a rag doll? And if they don't give, me, give them all your weight, just say it again, because it is important for the examiner to see that you've tried, even if they don't end up giving you all their weight, you've given it a good go. Um, and then any pain at any point, just throw that in there again. So with tone, does anyone want to be my, do you want to be it again, Michael? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> you can just stand up if you like. Um, if you're not busy, you, yeah, <laughs> just give me it. So again, so just go all floppy for me. So you want to hold them at the wrist and then just kind of above yeah, on the bicep, I guess. And then you wanna just do all the movements. So flex the elbow and then flex the shoulder and go up and down with the shoulder as well. If you can go backwards. And what you wanna be feeling is for any spasticity or cogwheeling, which is when they go like that, when you're trying to lift it up and down, there will always be, thank you, you can sit down. There'll always be a little bit of resistance um, on passive movement of anyone, even you and I, but there shouldn't be a whole lot of rigidity when they're lifting up and down. Um, so that's really tone. You want to see all their movements. And then the next one kind of tests their tone already because they're doing within power. You will test their own, um, not passive, but active tone where they're moving their arms up and down. So in power, this is where I have um, some fun kind of songs slash dances. Let me just get my little sheet. Um, so <laughs> I found like remembering all the nerves and what they supply and how it works with power really hard because they just kind of seem to follow no pattern at all. So the song I came up with, so you kind of have to do it with me. So you start with chicken wings, right? Okay. And so abduction is five and adduction is six, seven. So this is how I'm going to do it. So C, five, C, six, seven. So this is where I go. I go five, six, seven, five, six, seven, five, six, seven, eight, five, six, seven, eight, six, seven, seven, eight. Six, seven, seven, eight. T one. <laughs> That's the dance, all right? So we'll do it again. So you go five, six, seven, five, six, seven, 
five, six, seven, eight, five, six, seven, eight, six, seven, seven, eight, six, seven, seven, eight. Do you want? Okay. <laughs> so um, if you forget bits and pieces of that, ways to remember it. So um, five, six, pick up sticks. So if you forget what I do here, it's always five, six, then you'll remember to remember that that's seven, eight. So five, six, seven, eight. And then um, six, seven is like rev revving a motorbike. So six, seven, that's how I remember rev from seven. Um, and then that's it. So those are the, that's the way I remember this. Um, when you're testing the patient, you do those movements. So chicken wings for five, six, seven. So you're gonna get them to move against you at all times. Um, and then for elbow flexion extension, you're gonna get them to bring up like a boxer's pose and you're pushing against them or pulling them towards you. And then for the wrist, try to isolate the wrist at that joint. So one hand isolating the wrist, the other hand applying pressure against them. A good way with all power is to say to the patient, I'm gonna push against you, you just push back against me for all these actions. So that way you don't have to keep telling them which way to push and that should hopefully work. Does that all make sense? Excellent, okay. Um, so this is just showing you the different ones from Geeky Medics. So you can have a look on the slides. So you see how he just isolates the wrist there. Cool, and then finally you have the, the fingers. So I just remember T1, because that's the most important one for the fingers. There are some others thrown in there, but I don't really care about them. So the <laughs> most important with fingers is actually the opposition of the thumb. So that's C8, T1, and adduction as well, where it's the thumb and the pinky. And you're trying to ask them, don't let me break the loop. So you get them to put their thumb to their um, first finger and then their thumb to their pinky, and you try to break it. And for most patients, you won't be able to break it unless you're super, super strong. Um, and then the other one is, um, where is it? Oh yeah, flexion. So with flexion, you want them to just squeeze your fingers as tight as possible. Um, and so don't let, you ask them to not let your fingers slip out, if that makes sense. So those are the finger ones, and those are the ones you have to do in OSCEs. Okay, so lower limb. Another dance for you guys for lower limb. So. We're testing power, so we're going to make a P with our leg. So, ready? So I'm going to go out first, then I'm going to go sideways, I'm going to go back in, and then back. So that's my P. Do you see it on the floor? Okay. And so the first one is um, flexion of my hip. The second one is abduction. Then I'm adducting, and then I'm extending. Okay. So then this is how you do it. So you go L2, 3, L3, 4. L5, 6, L6, wait, no, I did that wrong, didn't I? Wait, I did it again. L2, 3, L3, 4, L4, 5, L5, S1, S2. So L2, 3, L3, 4, L4, 5, L5, S1, S2. Okay, so that's how I remember those. So you can see on there, um, I've tried to write them in there. So flexion of my, of my hip joint is L2, L3. And then abduction of my hip joint is L3, L4. Adduction is L4, L5. And then extension is L5, S1, S2. Um, and the good thing with that is with your knee, if you remember that extension of my hip is L5, S1, S2, then with your knee as well, flexion of your knee is also L5, S1. And then for extension of your knee, which is just kicking, that's kick the door three, four, kick the door. And then with ankles, I remember um, one, two is tying my shoe. So I'm like this. And the reason I try to remember going like this rather than this for tying my shoe is I think of a dainty shoe. So tie my dainty shoe because I feel like when you're dainty, your feet kind of point down. Um, and then the other one is four, five, toes to the sky. So five and sky kind of sounds similar. That's a bit of a stretch. Um, cool. And then at the end, you'll just say the patient has five out of five power in both limbs for all movements. So this is just showing you how you would test it. So for hip flexion, you're gonna get them lying down and just moving their hip and trying to push up against your force. For hip extension, their leg is up and you're trying to get them to push down into the bed against your force. Um, for knee flexion, you get them to hold the knee like this and then to again against your force, bend, your, bend their knee. So. I'm not doing that right. 
we'll work that out. Um, and then <laughs> for, for knee extension, it's the opposite. And then for ankles, again, isolate the ankle and then get them to make a dainty foot and then bring their toes to the sky. Cool. That was power. So, so far we've done tone, we've done power. Next is reflexes. So is the Pope really super Catholic? Um, so reflexes. So in the upper limb, you have your biceps, triceps, brachioradialis. So biceps is the pickup stick. So five, six, seven, eight. Um, so five, six, you want to just, with all of these, your fingers should be placed on the actual <coughs> tendon and the hammer should strike your fingers, not the patient themselves. If the patient is not, if you don't get the, um, reflex straight away, get them to grit their teeth on three. So say on three, I want you to grit your teeth and on three, you also hit the hammer because that will distract them and hopefully cause the, the reflex to show up. Um, so you should just feel a response even if you can't see it in most of these as well. Um, and then triceps, you want them to kind of lift their arm up off the table. You hold it in one hand and place your fingers over the tricep and then with the other hand, strike it. So it's a little bit difficult to like a tricep one. And again, they do have to be really floppy for all of these. So the same thing about making, just give me all of your weight and let your arm just be like a rag doll. And then finally, brachioradialis. I find this the hardest one to elicit because it's a bit hard to locate it on the arm, but it's about midway um, in the forearm. And you kind of want to turn their arm a little slightly. Um, and then again, place your hands over the top of where you believe the tendon should be. So it should be just under the bone. Um, and then strike again. Um, with all of these, mo most of the time the doctors are just happy to see that you know roughly where the three reflexes are. If you don't elicit them in the time, there are many reasons why that might not be happening for you right there. So don't stress about that if you don't quite get it. It's more about showing you know the steps towards it. Um, and if you were given more time, you probably would get those reflexes. Okay. And then with the lower limb, we have the knee jerk, the ankle jerk, and the Babinski. So with the knee jerk, you're going to hold the knee, you're going to again take all of the weight of the knee and then you're, this time you won't need to place your fingers on top because the knee is quite a big joint so it's okay to hit it straight on. Um, you've probably done this to your friends a few times and then you can just let it really hang and then hit right over the capsule and you want to see it really respond. Um, that's a normal reflex. A good thing to do if you can't get it with them lying down, ask them to turn and, and have their legs flop over the side of the bed. That's a good way to get a knee reflex as well. Ankle jerk. You have to actually rotate the leg a little bit to the side. Um, it's a bit of an uncomfortable position for the patient and then bend the knee slightly as well. That always helps. And then you can really get in to the joint just there. Um, so strike directly on the tendon and hold the ankle in dorsiflexion when you do it. And then you should feel it in your hand move when you strike it. And then finally for Babinski, the way to remember that one with L5, S1, S2 is one, two is um, again, tie my dainty shoe. So you should have the feet coming down like this towards you. And then L5 is the toes are coming into you for a high five. So that's a normal Babinski. If the foot goes down into a little dainty position and the toes curl to give you a high five, then all those nerves are intact. If they don't, so if the toes flex outwards, um, then that's an abnormal Babinski. So that's Babinski sign positive, okay? Um, and most of your patients will not have that. If they do, that's a sign of an upper motor neuron lesion. Cool. Sensation. So, how do we remember sensation? So, the way I remember the upper limb is that if you make like a thumbs up with your thumb, it looks kind of like a six. So, your thumb is C6, okay? And then I remember the rest from there. So if I can think of, this is going to be C5. Another way to remember that is your shoulder, right? So when you get referred pain because you've irritated the diaphragm, it goes to your shoulder. And the, what's the nerves that supply your diaphragm? Anyone remember? Three, four, five keep you alive, right? So, um, <laughs> so C5, C5. All this, this is all my head is just full with rhymes. Um, but yeah, so C5 is your shoulder. Then for your thumb, C6 and normally also your first finger. And then for your middle finger, that's C7. And then C8 comes up here, T1, and then T2. So as long as you remember that this is C6, you should be able to work backwards and forwards. Um, and then just remembering where you will touch 
with the cotton wool. So I like to touch in the shoulder, then either the, just the thumb straight away, so I know I've done that, and then the middle finger, and then the pinky, and then up to kind of the forearm, and then just near the underarm. Okay. And it's the same thing where you first place at center of their sternum. That's a really good thing to do, regardless of whether you then don't know where you're going here. If you show that you're doing this, it shows that you understand that putting it straight on their arm, why not elicit a response in the first place? Because they might have um, a neurological like symptom going on there that you're testing. Okay. Then you do vibration proprioception. So for vibration, again, place it on the sternum first because they will feel it there. Um, and then stop it and tell them that that's what you're testing for. So you're first testing to see if they can feel it buzzing. Then you want them to tell you when they feel it stop vibrating. Okay. So with that, when you do it on the actual patient, you'll do it on a bony prominence. So you often do it on this part of the thumb, the bony prominence of the thumb. So, so you get to hit the tuning fork somewhere, get them to close their eyes, place it on the bony prominence. They should tell you when it's, they can feel it vibrating and then stop it with your fingers and they should tell you when it stops vibrating. If they can't feel it there, then you keep going more proximally until you find a bony prominence they can feel it on. So from the thumb, you probably feel it, try the wrist, then you try the elbow, and then you try up in the shoulder on the clavicle. Okay. Um, and then for proprioception, importantly, you want to hold the thumb on its sides, not front or back. The reason is they can feel the pressure of your thumb, of your fingers moving it, if you put it like that. So you want to put it side to side so then they, they can't tell just by pressure. You want to first show them with their eyes open. So I'm going to just take your thumb, um, isolate it there, and then tell them, okay, so I'm, this is up, this is down, and this is neutral. So show them first. Say, does that make sense? They'll say, yeah. Say, okay, close your eyes now and tell me wh where your thumb is. So they'll close their eyes, and you want to first wiggle it, and then go and say, where is that? And they should tell you. And then wiggle it, and then, does that make sense? Perfect. Um, if they can't do it there, then you move up again. So you do the fingers, then you do the arm generally, um, sorry, the wrist, then you do the elbow and shoulder again. You won't have to do that in your exam. Okay, for lower limb, it's very similar. Oh, sorry. Um, the way I remember the lower limb dermatomes, um, okay, this one's a bit harder. So I like to think, I, I try to picture this. So I try to picture that, that they do kind of run diagonally down your leg. Um, and then I like to think about L1 being on my hips, that's where it all starts. Um, and then L2 comes down kind of near your groin. And then I think of three and four that kick the door, remember, they're both the knee, right? So three, I also think of three and knee rhyme. Anyway, three comes down medially across your knee. And then four is the other the lateral part of your knee on both sides. Okay, and then you can kind of work down from there. So four, which goes on the lateral part of your knee, also goes to your big toe. And then five goes to your middle three. And then S1 picks up your pinky. On the back, S2 does that middle part of your leg. Um, and then it goes up into the sacral part of your body. So three, four, and five are the butthole, which is nice. Um, so to, you won't have to test that. You'll just have to test probably up until S2. Um, and so to do that with the patient, I always do L1 at the very top and then L2 just below it. And then I go to the knee straight away. So I remember. So then L3, L4, or you can test the big toe if you'd like for L4. And then middle toes and then the pinky. Um, and if you can, do the back. And again, the same thing with sensation as you did in the face. Test both sides and do them while their eyes are closed, ask them if they can feel it. Is it different on either side? If you guys have to leave, that's all good. Go for it. Um, same with vibration, same with proprioception again. Um, and that's it. So, if anyone can stick around and wants to try it out, then we can do that. Um, otherwise, finished. Any questions from anybody? Yeah, please. Um, how do the, like, do actually need so that will be P plus question. That will be at the end. In the Viva, they could say to you, okay, so which nerve were you testing when you did this reflex, for example? So if you can say it, then that's amazing. Yeah, it is an extra added flourish. But next year, you will need to know it. So it's nice to learn it early if you can. Yeah.
Thanks. No worries. And guys, if you have a chance, I'm up to my portfolio now, so I'm nearly finished, but I need to like have evidence of different things. If you have a chance and want to do this quick survey for me, that would be awesome. Um, it should only take like two minutes. I only added like four questions in there, but that would be really great. <laughs> Thank you so much for listening and coming, and I hope that helped. And I'll give these slides to Michael so you can get all the info.